We're in our Apostles' Creed series, and there's something I want to put on the table here today. These words, this is where we've got to. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Last week we looked at the uh, power and work of the Holy Spirit. He hasn't changed, he's just changing us. And today we're going to look at the Holy Catholic Church. Just for the record, Catholic is a word that was used, uh, is used before Catholic with a capital C. Catholic means uh, general and eclectic and drawn together. So the church, um, seen and unseen, the church throughout the ages, the church across the world is what the... Uh, the Apostles' Creed begun to be written in the 4th century, 5th century, sort of settled upon in the 8th century. And then we've just found it in a cupboard to have a look at. So the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Again, the same thing, not talking so much about Holy Communion with the bread and the wine, but the, the, the togetherness, the us-ness. Um, not just us here, but as we'll see, uh, the fellowship, the communion of saints, um, and the, the, the festal procession of angelic host, as we'll see, is, accompanies us as we gather with him. So I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Very important, I didn't separate the Holy Spirit from the Holy Church. They belong together, as we'll see. But when I, what comes to mind, uh, your mind, when church is mentioned. Turn to the person next to you or think on your own or, or text somebody. What, what sort of words come to mind when church is mentioned? Dig a bit, get past all the, the, the surface stuff and under the ground a minute. Oh, and the other thing is, would you, uh, you haven't set it, would you set a timer on your phone? To get, take your phone out a minute, would you? Take your phone out, put it on airplane mode, um, and then set a timer for 30 minutes. And then when it goes off, I'll stop. If I hear it, if you set your timer for less than 30 minutes, the Lord is here, his spirit is with us. So what comes to mind when church is mentioned? Why don't you just say that for a minute? Maybe if you're willing, you could shout out. Come on, chop, chop, clock's ticking. No, no, in a moment, I'll, I'll shout, I'll ask you. So what comes to mind? The good stuff and the bad stuff. Okay. Joyce. A group of people that meet together to worship the Lord. Anyone else? What comes to mind? Family. Family. These are all good things, aren't they? Buildings. buildings. Beautiful buildings. Beautiful, buildings. Beautiful old, big, <laughs> brilliant buildings. <laughs> Empty buildings. Global? Is that it? Is that what you were thinking? No one had a, a, words like abuse? Persecution. Persecution. Memories. Memories. Abuse of power. Control. Anything else? Political? Love. Love. Come on, anything else? Anything from this side? You can beat this side. Come on, anyone take us? Going once, going to anyone? No, this side. Traditions and rice. The bride. The bride. Can you see, and maybe I, maybe I put words in your mouth, I don't know, but it, when we say church, what comes to mind? Can you imagine if you talk to family and friends or you put it out on social media, what comes to mind when you say church? It, it's a, a bit mixed up, isn't it? Or is it? Is it a pure church? No, it's mixed. So what comes to my mind are these four words. The Holy Spirit's in the church. There's no such thing as the Holy Spirit apart from the church. But we get confused in that because we desperately need our buildings, don't we? No. No, we like our buildings in the UK because it rains. And there's no, no need for buildings. They're nice, but they're not necessary. It's the Holy Spirit in the church. Uh, and these four words come to my mind. Lordship of Jesus, worship, discipleship, and partnership. 
So let me, uh, I assume you were on the screen, so thank you for the feedback. But I just wanted to say what I was thinking, what came to mind. Lordship of Jesus. Jesus over all, especially me. When we say lordship, when I say lordship, I'm, I'm not talking about everyone else initially. I'm talking about Jesus over me. And then I'll go, and then I'll go from there. Otherwise, I can be a hi- hypocrite. And as a vicar, I can be good at that. I've got religious qualifications all over the place. Okay, so you're talking about me, talking about you. He is my shield and my defender. My safety is in him. So when COVID started up, my first thought, or our first thought was, um, my times are in his hands, Psalm 31. I wash my hands, I wear my mask, I keep away from human beings. I couldn't really do that. But my times are in his hands because he is my shield, he's my provider, and all things come from him. Therefore, he, is, he has everything, and everything I have is from him. He's my security. Apart from him, I need nothing. Which takes a miracle, doesn't it? He is my everything because in him I have more than I ever dreamed or imagined. What can we pray for you? Well, to see what God has already given me. He is my judge and my propitious sacrifice. This is a lovely word, propitious sacrifice. He is my judge. He is the one who has seen everything. Nothing is beyond his sight or his grasp. He knows everything about me, even the things I didn't tell my mum or Claire. He knows everything, and he is my judge. And I say, wow, he's my judge, and he has stepped in for me. He is my propitious sacrifice. Propitious sacrifice, it means that Jesus bore the wrath of God, his holy wrath, in my place. So he bore the wrath, I received the love of God. And I'm dead and alive in him. I remember, let's mention Hugh. When I first met Hugh, I sat down with Hugh and I said, Hugh, tell me about yourself. His first words were, I'm dead. (laughs) And it went on from there. You need to meet Hugh. I'm dead. The old silk has gone. The new has come. I'm alive in him. Worship. Everything unto him. That's my definition of worship. I don't know if it's adequate, but let's start with it. And so let's do this together. We are caught up in heavenly adoration of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When's the worship going to start? It's a silly question. The question is more, when's it going to stop? It's a silence in heaven for half an hour. That's all you're going to get. But until that time, there's an eternal worship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the company of myriad angels. And we're caught up with that from within the life of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, well, I just thought church was about coffee rotors and stuff. Well, this is, this is awesome. Look what God is doing. Everything is a reason to say thank you for his goodness. Even the bad stuff. Because we put everything under him. And with every breath and in every moment, I offer my life as a living sacrifice of worship. My workplace is my primary, primary theater of worship. My home life is a place of worship. My private life, my secret life, my hidden life is a place of worship. Discipleship, my definition, practice the profession, Jesus is Lord. Not many of us would say Jesus isn't Lord. It's not the sort of question you get wrong, is it? It's practicing it. I'm, so therefore, I'm honest about my sin. Not with everyone. I'm not going to tell you everything, but I'm going to tell someone. Because Jesus has paid the price for me. He's forgiven me my sin, therefore it's lost its power. Be honest about my sin, my past, and my fears. I'm a working example of repentance. I'm not perfect. No, you're not. I'm a perfect example of repentance. Everything is an opportunity to release my grip on false idols and take hold of Jesus. And my hands will only stand so much. I cannot hold on to this if I am holding on to him. Everyone I meet is a person loved by God and I'm aware of the Holy Spirit using me to bless them. I got a text during worship and I don't advocate looking at your phone during worship during our time together. 
of a friend who took his son to church for the first time today in another part of the world, and he was just telling me about how it went. I, everyone I meet is a person loved by God, and that friend, it wasn't me like saying, oh, Lord, make it happen, make it happen, let me twist the conversation around. I just was chatting to him about something completely irrelevant. And he led, sorry, he led the conversation, he asked the question. And now he's telling me how it's going, but I'm aware. Partnership. You ready for this? Partnership, meaning, in the Bible, meaning in Philippians especially, we are one in him. So understand myself as significant in Jesus' family. I know who you are and you know me. I'm not good at everything. The Lord has gifted me in something. You know what that is. I'm not strong at everything. I'm weak at some things. You, you know what it is. Not everybody, but if in a smaller group, or, or some of you know me for long enough, and by God's grace, I know you too. I'm not fearful that you will abandon me. I'm in life-giving community with you. And this partnership which has been used as fellowship, which is one of these funny old words, isn't it? You chat over the friends, you chat over the one side of the fence to your neighbor, you're talking about spades and sparrows and roses, and then you have the same conversation to your other neighbor who's a Christian. This is a chat, this is fellowship. You see how bad it's got. It comes from this word koinonia, translated partnership, which maybe has a bit more, it's a new word to at least have to think about it. And it, it, it comes up a number of times in Philippians. Ultimately, it comes on that we on each other's hearts, really bothered about one another. We're sharing in suffering. We're suffering for the Lord Jesus. Uh, we're in each other's prayers, and we're supplying one another's material needs. That's how the word is used, uh, partnership. So this is what it could look like, but there's a problem. It's a big problem, isn't it? You see, because Jesus' church in whom the Holy Spirit dwells is mixed with our ideas and experiences of church. The church is getting away in the way of the church. The church is the worst advert for the church and the only advert's got. Church is responsible for uh, all manner of horrific activities and abuses. And it's the place the Holy Spirit dwells. Can you see how you, you, it's very difficult to separate the two in this life, but we need to be aware of the two. The problem is we have language when we start talking about things over this side and we say we mustn't judge. Full of grace, lots of grace. You're right, behind that, we need to, judgment starts with the household of God. Let's get serious about what's actually going on in the church. And it's this little alliteration. It's the etc. It's the other stuff. The Holy Spirit, it, it resides in his people. He's not moved, but we stick stuff on. We add all sorts of stuff. So we end up, uh, uh, my, in my words, not yours. Yeah. Lordship. Jesus is invited to coexist with my false self. Well, we'll say Jesus is Lord. Of course we will. But I'm, what I'm actually saying is, Jesus, you come be the plaster. You can live in my heart, but nowhere else. I'm driven by fear to all kinds of false comforts. I recognized that years ago among a group of leaders, contemporaries. I suddenly realized we're all actually driven by fear. And so was I. And, and I wrestle with that now. But I'm uh, driven by fear. Why, why do you speak and act and do and dress and do stuff the way you do? Primarily because of fear. Not now. I just thought it would be different to wear jeans other than jeans today. Sorry, I mustn't mix a serious thing with a stupid thing. 
Are you praying for me? Okay. I'm not sure I have done enough to be worthy of the God I imagine. I, that's G, God little G. Okay, some people who've been in church for years are feeling like they should become atheists. I would tentatively say, well, that's brilliant news. Which God is it that you don't believe in? Because the God I believe in, the God of the scriptures, is very different to the God of our imagination. Uh, if only I was a proper Christian, if only I did enough, if only I, no, hang on, the, the wonderful thing is Jesus has done enough. If only I prayed enough, Jesus intercedes for us and I am in him. And in him there isn't a moment that I'm not interceding. It's just this other stuff, I got this opportunity to walk with him. This is just who I am and I'm stuck with it. And in brackets, get used to it. I'm not going to change, you're just going to have to work around me. And leading, therefore, people who have those characteristics, I will need to manipulate you, which I can't, or I'll need God to, trans, uh, to change you, transform you, transform me. And I'm blissfully unaware of the impact of my family of origin and what that has upon me. I'm a new creation. Oh, but there's a list of... Uh, all sorts of hard things in my, in my history. And I, as a new creation, I'm new in Christ, I've got verses, and yet I just reenact all the stuff and hurt that I've seen unnecessarily, blissfully unaware. Oh, but Jesus is Lord, right? Worship. We ask ridiculous questions when it comes to worship. I don't mean to be offensive. I just need to want, want us to think about what these things mean. When it comes to worship, we ask, what church do you go to? I mean, do we realize how silly that sounds? The Holy Spirit resides in his church. It's like, where, where, where's your church then? Oh, they're at, they're at work. They're in the bank. They've gone fishing. They're asleep. Do you, do you see what I'm, this is what we actually believe. And everything unto him becomes everything that someone else does on a Sunday morning. Just an observation, the church in the West declines to a Sunday morning. I don't know if you noticed that. This is wonderful, but it only points beyond itself to what else is happening. My nightmare scenario of being abandoned, irrelevant, and worthless demands of strange sacrifices from me. In fact, I'll do a load of things, and I'll invest myself in a load of sinful activities in order to feel different. Discipleship. I'm more aware of the accounts I follow and subscribe to than the Holy Spirit who resides within me. My prayer life is an holy moaning. I noticed that with me. This, this time last year, I was signed off. I know, I've been signed off once for my neck. That was sort of a, I don't know what that was about, but anyway, it's better now. But then signed off, the doctor said, stop, you've got to stop. This time last year. And I noticed over the months that my prayer life changed. And I look back on the previous years. Most of my prayer life was moaning. Lord, please make it stop. Please can I come home? Please change everyone else. Please change me. Come on, fix me. If I push it, what I was doing was I was using God to get him to do stuff. I noticed over the months of this last year, my prayer life was more of relaxing with him. I say relaxing because I couldn't move much. I said, okay, Lord, what, what, what are we doing today? What's interesting today? What's, what's got your attention today? But discipleship can become a, like a, a holy moaning. My maturity is measured in previous experience of other people's walk with Jesus. What I mean by that is, how's life going? We always m trace that back to when we were last doing something or we were last part of something where God was doing something extraordinary, back in that church or back in this place or back in that time in history. It's old manner. I live out of my wounded self and project that onto others. I'm thinking of all the other people this slide applies to. Partnership. 
Remember how good it was? Well, who's meeting my needs then? Where do I fit in? Well, I might be there. I'm, I might be at the group. I might be at church. Uh, I'll see. My generosity is my feedback based on my experience of how I feel. If God, small g, was really God, small g, this wouldn't be so difficult and I wouldn't feel like this. Is this too bleak or too accurate? Don't answer that. How much time we got? How's that going? So church as a human system, we want to go for a a change from one to the other. Church as a human system. The church is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And we can't separate the two. It, we, we can't get on the Mayf- Mayflower as the Pilgrim Fathers and go and start this all again in New York and other places like that. Because you take your problems with you. And what we need is something to change in us together. We need the Lord to change us inside. So to get from that, to that transformation, I, I want, want us to realize that an example from Hebrews 12. So Hebrews writing to the Hebrew people, saying that you have had a, you've had a system of relating to God, of believing in God. You have not come to a mountain, mountain, big deal, that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. That's the system, for example. The writer of the Hebrews says this, but you have come to Mount Zion, the place of meeting, the place of encounter, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Look around. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. To the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. To the church who've been born again throughout the history whose names are in, written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all. To the spirits of the righteous made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and of the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Can you see what I'm trying to do? Is that We're going to go from a system to what God is actually doing. Make it personal. Consequently, so Paul's writing to the Ephesians, talking about the division between Gentiles and Jews, and how God's promise was for the Jews, but actually if you read the scripture, obviously God has got the whole world in mind. How's he going to bring the two together? He's going to bring the two together in Christ. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, his family. His oikos, his kebab. No, that, sorry, that's going to get some feedback for that. It's stupid. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building, this is the only bit about buildings, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit, what comes to mind when you talk about church? Look around. So, Jesus' church is eternal and unseen. Jesus' church is seated with him. We're seated with him in heavenly places. And Jesus' church is present and visible. Look around. Jesus' church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' church is at work in his world. Now, just in case there's uh, any Anglicans around, Article 19 of the 13 Articles, titled, Of the Church. The visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men, fill in the blanks, if you, obviously, in which the pure word of God is preached, I'm doing my best, 
and the sacraments be duly administered, we'll do that next week, according to Christ's ordinance in all those things that are of necessity are requisite to the same. The, church, the Anglican writings, an example, the Church of Christ is a congregation of gathered people. So using a symbol, us, we're at the bottom there. We, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. You get the message, you're connected. You're connected because, not because you have been so good, but because God has been so good, because God has moved in and dwells in us, dwells in you, dwells in us together by His Spirit. Isn't that extraordinary? All God's people said, yeah, it's amazing. And above that, the top line, we've got the gathered church. We've read about that. The, sorry, above that, we've got the eternal church. The example from Hebrews. Actually, we, we are meeting in, uh, together and the church has gathered throughout the ages. And all those people, we're gathered with them in some sense. It's the bits in the middle that often trip us up. Let's take the organization bit. I'm not anti-institution, but I can see that when an institution starts to worry about its own life, it's normally declined. When an institution, a charity, an organization, is more concerned what it is there to equip and to do, it's doing well. It's when it turns in on itself and says, oh, our numbers are down, which is terrible. We're going to do Let's change a few things. And I could, have, I could spend all day moaning about organizations. I don't think that would help. I'm not anti-organization. I'm just saying we need to be super aware. And just because something's called the Church of England doesn't actually mean it's the church, even according to its own articles. An organization an administrative hub, an institution, is there to serve where the real action is. The gathering. How many people did Jesus say had to be there for him to be in the midst? Come on, shout it out. Two or three. And we say, well, let's put a few more in. No, that's because of some daft idea of growth. When Jesus says two or three, oh, there's a lot of action goes on when people get together in twos or threes in his name and seek his face. So that would be, if you like to see it in a, a logo form, if you want to get the message, if you want to really connect, these things have got to be taken into account. I think we've got some significant issues going on with the organization level, but that's beyond our control. So let's bring this into land, as they say. Lordship, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We run to our comforts when we're like this. We invest our mind, our money and our time in things that we believe in. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, uh, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble, gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Know yourself in order to know God. What does that mean? So it's all about Jesus. Yep, it's 100% about Jesus, and it's 100% about you. Know yourself in order to know God. Where are the pain points? Where are the pinch points? Where's, the, where, where's it going all wrong? Typically, we would hide all that, but as we bring that into God's presence, that is where we meet him. So, a question. Where do we experience comfort apart from Jesus? Because that's indicative of where we believe the Lordship is. I'd hope you go back and have a look at some of these questions. Lordship. Secondly, worship. Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, everything unto him. Do not conform, <coughs> conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Know yourself in order to know God. What are we running to? Where are we conforming to this world? That's going to take a little bit of reflection, a little bit of thinking, Lord, where am I doing this? It'd be an important question for us to consider, maybe with one or two others. But a question for us personally to look at is, where am I hiding from him? If it's all about everything unto him, or, or Romans 12, if you want to use that verse much better than my summary, if it's all about everything, what am I concealing? Because that's really where the action will take place. What are you hiding from him? I don't, I don't want to spell it out and embarrass anybody. Discipleship. When the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Lordship, worship. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. They make disciples of, of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, helping them to, to actually shift allegiance from anything to Jesus and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Everything is a discipleship moment. How is God getting my attention? A bad, things, a bad thing happens in the week, in the day, and the objective is to forget it, move on. No, don't. Don't do that. Don't waste your pain. How about you sit with it, dwell with it? Why is it you're so triggered by that? Why is it that I'm so grumpy about that? How come that, do you get that sort of, I don't know what's going on in here, but there's a sort of release. It's like a bomb goes off inside. What is that? Does anyone know medically? It's just a, you think here because of the pain. We we'll say, Lord, look, at, help me out. How is God getting my attention? What does it mean in this moment to repent and believe? If you limit this to becoming a follower of Jesus and never do it again, you've misunderstood what repent and believe is. Repent and believe is what happens is the king of the kingdom comes into our lives. So often disguised as our life experience an indication, an invitation to come to him. Who am I going to share this with? had a, a brilliant unsolicited conversation with someone this week, a friend this week. They're asking me extraordinary questions, so I was transparently honest. Do you know that they, they, they didn't run away screaming? Actually, they, they stepped in. And they asked me more questions. I wasn't trying to show off or anything like that. I had nothing to show off about. I was just being really honest. This is what happened. This is what I'm struggling with. This is how it used to be. This is how it is now. This is, I just put it all out there. I was vulnerable. And in that moment, trust was built. And they kept asking me more questions. And I kept answering them. And I asked them questions. What does it mean to repent and believe? Who am I going to share this with? And then partnership. <clears throat> I thank my God every time I remember you, writes Paul from his prison cell. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Practically, if there was one outcome of this, 
that we could do together, it would be this question. Who are the few that I'm going to commit to over the next six months? Who are the few? So often we atomize, we, in, we isolate, we individualize being a follower of Jesus. Yes, you're full of the Holy Spirit, and it's a wonderful thing. But the part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that we would begin to relate to others well. I'm not talking about everybody. The purpose of a Sunday morning, I think, is, is big picture. Come together for, it feels like a family party. We're together in the corporate setting to worship. We, we, you get to, we, we preach and we teach. But the real action, you know the real action's done in smaller settings where someone's saying, oh, why is that? How's that? Tell us about that. Can we pray for that? You've been saying this for six months and nothing's changed. When, when are you going to actually put your faith into action? Or you say it your way, that's, that's why no one's in my groups. But um, that's not true, again, I'm sorry. But come on. This is our moment. What's it going to take? Pandemic? World war? Financial crash? Looks like they're all on their way. Well, God in this moment residing in us is drawing us gently to him. That's a key question for, I'd love you to all answer that for yourself in his presence. Who are the few that I'm going to commit to over the next six months? And week after week, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to be washing my hair. I'm going to be there and I'm going to turn up. I'm going to be fully present for them and therefore for me. And all of this stuff is probably going to go under the radar. It's going to grow organically. And the church will thrive. How are we going to prioritize Jesus? Lordship, worship, discipleship, in partnership. I was worried about this morning because I'd had too much to say. I think I'd probably write. But that's what my heart is for, the local church, is that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is not where the action is, although it's fun, it's significant. The real action is what happens next. The real hap action happens in your lives. The real action happens as you seek him, as you pray, as you seek his comfort, and as together we walk in partnership as his people. Lord, we are yours, and you are ours. We have nothing to fear but you. Everything comes from you. All good and perfect gifts come from the Father of lights. And Holy Spirit, we praise you that you are residing within us as we are seated with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. I pray, Lord, that this wouldn't just be a, some ethereal concept, but this would be our life. As we're awakened in the night because of children teething and nappies and stuff, as we're exhausted, I ask you to help us to be present with you in every moment as we're scared and fearful about our health, our anxieties, our work, the news. Help us, I pray, to sit with you, to rest with you. And Lord, you sent us to make disciples of all nations. And we, it's very easy to park this and say, Lord, well, we can't really do nations. But Lord, help us, I pray, to ask the person in front of us over these next few days. Open our eyes to see. Help us to be committed, I pray, as family to a few. In Jesus' name. Amen.